And I would like to introduce Valérie Brocard. She's a senior scientist at the Institut de Levage in France. And she'll be sharing the last presentation of the day, presentation number 15 from speaker number 22. Country number 13, Valérie Brocard. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's still, the, it's still night here. Uh, so uh, this presentation was prepared together with my colleague, Jean-Louis Poulet. So I'm, I'm working on grazing. He's working on uh, milking machinery. So together we prepared a presentation about the situation of uh, robotic milking in France. And we will be talking about uh, economic efficiency quite a lot because it's a very important uh, point for the for the farmers of course we are both working for the french livestock institute um, so the french livestock institute it's an applied research organization we are funded by the farmers and working for the farmers uh, we are both located in the western part of france in Brittany. Uh, Brittany is producing around 25 percent of the french milk so it's an important region for dairy production for bovine dairy production uh, jean-louis is working as a project manager in milking research and development uh, technologies is working on the relation between the interface between uh, the animals the machinery and the milkers in goats in ewes and dairy cows because we are milking these three types of uh, animals in france and uh, also working um, secretary of the committee uh, organizing the relation with uh, the, 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 the the milking equipment companies and uh, also working for idf federation and I'm, I'm working on uh, dairy cows feeding and management, um, low input systems, grazing with large herds, and we've been working together on combining robotic milking and grazing. Uh, part of the autograss milk project as well that uh, Bernadette, uh, Eva and uh, Francoise already talked about. So that's so the way we met. Uh, it's uh, combining uh, robotic milking and grazing. And you can see a picture of uh, Trevare's experimental farm that uh, uh, looks a little bit like what Francoise presented in Belgium, but it's just a different color. Uh, a few words about the bovine dairy sector in France. Uh, we are producing around 24 million liters of milk uh, in 57,000 dairy farms, which makes an average of 420,000 liters per farm. So we, we can say we still have uh, family farms with an average of 64 cows per farm. Uh, so this is an important figure uh, for one AMS box. 70% of the farms are located in plains, but 30% of the farms are located in mountain and Piedmont areas. Um, we can consider that 90% of the French dairy cows are still grazing. Uh, some are only grazing during two months per year. Other ones are grazing all year long. But uh, most of the French cows are still going out. Uh, and it's particularly the case in the mountain areas, of course. Uh, because of our geography, our history, but also sociology, the distance between the, the, production, the, the, the production areas and the cities, uh, we have a huge diversity in production systems and one of our uh, goals uh, in my institute is to describe these production systems. On the map you can see lots of different colors. Uh, we describe 13 different production systems. I, I won't go into the details just to tell you that we have three main production areas. So we have the green production areas on the map which are the lowlands dairy areas where the reproduction is based on grazed grass and maize silage. Uh, in these areas, uh, most of the dairy farms have, are specialized in dairy production. When we say specialized, it means that probably there are 15 to 20 hectares of crops uh, together with dairy production. Then you have the blue areas, uh, which are the crop and livestock areas located in plains. In these farms, dairy production and crop production have the same importance in terms of profit. Um, so you will have wheat, barley, uh, rapeseed, uh, corn in the southwest of France together with potatoes or uh, other vegetables together with dairy production. And the reproduction uh, is still based on a uh, lot of silage, uh, grass silage, maize silage, uh, also uh, part of grazed grass and a lot of byproducts, in particular in the north of France. And then you have the purple areas. In the purple areas, so there are mountain and Piedmont areas. Uh, usually farms are specialized in dairy production. 
um, with a low stocking rate, around one cow per hectare. Uh, based, the systems are based on grass, so grazed grass, uh, together with grass silage or hay, according uh, to the, the specification of uh, the cheese production. So this is a very important point. 15% of our milk is produced under specifications, usually for cheese production. We have around uh, 400 uh, different types of cheese produced. 10% uh, are protected denominations of origins uh, with a very strong uh, specifications on the way uh, you can feed your animals, uh, the type of forage, the amount of concentrate, the breed, uh, and the way you milk your cows. And this has an impact on uh, my presentation on AMS because most of the time uh, robotic milking is forbidden. And once a day milking is also forbidden. Uh, not only PDOs, we also have organic milk, we have mountain milk, we have regional identities like uh, Normandy milk or whatever. Um, so this is a very important for the French dairy production. We have a strong and old link between uh, the territories and the image of the dairy products, which leads to very diversified typical products. And for many uh, cheese productions, um, it's, it's not considered as positive to associate a very traditional image and way of processing cheese to something modern like a, a robot. But for the farmers, it's considered as an, an asset for the future because the milk price is very high compared to conventional milking. And that, these are the regions where you have the highest replacement uh, and generational renewal. So uh, let's go to robotic milking in France and you can see uh, on the bottom of the slide that uh, we can also put a double uh, robots uh, in trailers uh, to, to produce cheese <laughs> uh, far from the, the shed. <laughs> Um, so the sales of robots probably started around the year 2000 in France uh, with a very important increase between 2005 and 2015 and it seems now that we have reached a plateau. Uh, the blue curve is uh, the robots at milk performance uh, control. So these are the exact figures we have. Uh, then we try to guess how many robots we have together altogether because uh, we consider that 70% of the farms are at official milk performance record. So from these figures, we can guess that we have uh, 5,000 farms equipped at the moment, which makes uh, around uh, 9 to 10 percent of the dairy farms in France that are equipped with a robot. Last year, the sales decreased by 23 percent compared to the year before. So maybe we have reached a plateau and uh, maybe uh, the maximum uh, equipment rate in France will be around the 12 of, of 15 percent of the dairy farms in, in the future if we try to guess. Um, some figures about the robots installed. Uh, so 5,000 farms, which are mostly equipped with only one AMS box, uh, but uh, you can see 75% of the farms have only one box. Uh, but uh, in these farms, the average cow numbers is 76 cows, which means that uh, with the type of systems the farmers usually have, with not so much resort to grazing, they are mostly indoor systems and uh, it means that the box is completely saturated with a lot of uh, problems for cow traffic. Uh, then 25% of the farms have two boxes. In this case, uh, the boxes are not saturated because it's uh, an average of 50 cows per AMS and very few farms have three boxes or more uh, when they have a robot. The average figure is 1.6 boxes per farm. Depending on the region, according to what I said about the, the cheese processing regions, uh, some regions have no um, robots at all and in other country, counties of the, of the country you can have up to 23% of uh, farms equipped with a uh, milking robot. So what are the key drivers for adopting AMS in France? Uh, the first one, like uh, in many countries, it's uh, difficult to find staff on farms. The availability of labor first is the first driver. Then uh, for the farmers themselves, uh, most of the farmers are milking themselves. It's a physical load and a penibility of, of labor in dairy farms. Then you have the attraction for new technologies and robotization for some farmers. And uh, like in many countries, uh, some farmers just want to do like their neighbors. And uh, if somebody started uh, buying a robot, they will buy a robot as well. Now the key challenges for, for the farmers and for the advisors. Uh, first, the first challenge is to keep the economic efficiency of dairy production. 
The second one will be the integration of the robots in the different production systems we have, in particular if we want to keep grazing. And I will come back to these two first challenges. Uh, and then, as I said, part of Dairy France uh, refuses using robots uh, in the areas with protected denominations of origin cheese. Um, because there is a problem of, uh, with the technology of uh, processing the milk to produce cheese. And sometimes it's not a problem of technology, it's a problem of, uh, of uh, communication and uh, they think they, they run the risk for the image of the dairy products. And finally, I would say one problem is uh, the average size of the French farms. I said 64 cows, which is okay for one box, but then you have a threshold effect. Um, the ceiling is rich with one or two boxes according to the current size of the French farms. It's difficult to pay back for a second box. And uh, then uh, for the largest farms, they would rather choose a rotary than uh, having three boxes. And it's only a very, very limited amount of, of dairy farms um, that can afford to do that at the moment in France. So I will come back to the challenge of economic efficiency first. Uh, talk about the demonstrations. <laughs> um, so if we look at the figures at the moment, uh, an AMS project in average, uh, it's uh, a complete set of investments. The first one is a blue box. You have to buy the robot. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's a De Laval robot. It's just the color of the, of, of the box. But it's first of all, you have to pay the robot. Um, two years ago, it was around uh, 112,000 uh, euros. Uh, today, it would rather be 125,000 euros per box. But then you have to uh, integrate the robots in your shed. So you have to pay for the machinery, for the power supply, etc. Then you have some induced works most of the time because you have to change uh, and turn to chemicals. You have to buy a scrapper. You have to extend your storage because your cows are spending more time inside. So the slurry storage has to be increased. Then you have to buy some related equipment like all the gates for the cow's traffic. And then you have some options uh, from extra feeding uh, to concentrate feeder up to the, the buffer tank, which is uh, quite expensive. So the whole project, uh, typical quote for the whole project at the moment, uh, you have the AMS box first, then you have the cost of the integration in the shed. Uh, with different type of works, is work, masonry, frame and electricity. Then you have to pay for the related equipment, the tubular frames for the co flow, the gates, the, the feeding screw for the uh, concentrated feeders, etc. And so the total cost uh, two years ago was on around uh, 155,000 euros and today it's probably 168. And then you have to pay for extra options uh, that might be only 700 euro, but it might be 9,000 euro if you if you had a buffer tank. So altogether, the total quote for purchasing one robot it's uh, a lot of money. So this is the investment in a robot. But then you have the operating costs on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, then we can compare what is advertised by the companies to what it really costs when you look at the the accounting books of the farmers. Um, what is advertised by the companies is usually uh, the maintenance contract, which are very different from one farm to another. Uh, e even if you stay in the same uh, brand, uh, you can have big difference between the farms. Sometimes uh, the maintenance contract is including the official control, uh, like uh, the one we perform in France, Optitrette. Sometimes it includes consumables, but not all the time. Sometimes it includes some preventive maintenance labor cost as well, but not all the time. So this is what is advertised by the company before you buy the robot. But what it really costs, it's what you can see in the accounting books of the farms. And we have developed a method uh, to compare all the farms on the same basis and also to compare with the other types of uh, milking machineries. So what it really costs, it's a contract of course, but also all the consumables were, that were not included, the working parts and chemicals, all the curative interventions on the robots and spare parts, uh, the official controls of the milk meters, uh, optitrate control, and all the satellite expenses, which might be really related to a satellite, like phone or internet, and the insurances. So when we use this method to compare the costs, uh, we can see that uh, we have here the operating costs for the different types of milking machinery, the milking parlors, the AMS, and the rotaries. 
uh, you have the figures for 2016 and the figures for 2017. I just added them yesterday with a number of um, machineries uh, compared, the accounting books that were used. And here you have the operating cost in euros per thousand liters. Uh, for the milking parlors, the operating cost is around 6.8 euro for 1,000 liters produced, and you can see that the viability among the farms is not very high. Uh, it's almost the same for the rotary parlors, 6.3 euros per 1,000 liters, and very little viability among farms. Now, the AMS, uh, the operating cost is uh, twice more expensive. Uh, it's around 15 euros per 1,000 liters produced, and there's a huge viability between farms. So, uh, first, first message for the farmer, it's very interesting to benchmark your operating costs to, to see uh, how, how you, you're performing compared to your neighbors. Before you invest in a robot, uh, you should know that it's not only the investment, it's also the cost afterwards, and it's around 15 euros per thousand liter of milk. Uh, if you purchase a robot. Uh, you have higher costs with robots compared with the other types of milking machineries, but of course it's providing a higher level of technology and uh, you have to take the labor into account, which is also really different from a milking machine. There's a high viability uh, with robots among the different farms. Uh, because we divide by the volume of milk produced, the impact of the amount of milk produced is, uh, is important on the results. Uh, it depends on what the farmer is able to do by himself. Some farmers are not touching the robot at all and other ones are able to make some small repairs by themselves and the type of contracts they have signed. So this was the operating cost. And then you have the impact of uh, changing the system because you have bought a robot. The production systems in the farms that have bought a robot uh, are more animal intensive. Uh, we have uh, some farm networks in France that we are following for uh, almost 40 years now, uh, 35 years. Uh, we, we are able to compare farms in the same region with the same production system and the same amount of cows. And when we make, when we make this type of comparison, uh, uh, comparing farms in the same background with a robot or without a robot, we can see that the farms with robots are producing more milk per cow because they use more concentrates. They are also decreasing the amount of grazed grass in a system and uh, resorting more to, to silage. So uh, with these uh, higher levels of concentrate and maize silage, they have a higher feeding cost compared with the farms with no robots. And if we look now at the price, at the milk price, it's always lower with robots. One explanation is the lower uh, protein content because they produce more milk, so there's a dilution effect. But the second explanation is uh, due to the penalties on milk quality. Uh, most of the farms uh, have uh, higher penalties related to the milk uh, payment system after they have uh, both implemented a robot compared to before. Here you have a study on 43 Britain farms where we compared um, the quality of the milk and the penalties on the milk payment uh, two years before they uh, bought a robot and, and after buying a robot. Uh, most of the farms have had penalties uh, because uh, the quality of the milk has decreased after installing the robots, but it's not always with the same explanation. 25% of the farms have penalties because of a uh, high cell count level, because they had a significant increase in cell counts after buying or purchasing the robots. Two thirds of the farms have problems with lipolysis, which is a, a, a payment criterion in France, in Western France, because we are producing a lot of butter. 20% uh, of the farms have problems with, with butyric spores because they are using more silage, in particular grass silage, which is also a risk factor for lipolysis and 20, 25% of the farms have problems with germs. So it's not always the same explanation, but most of the farms have more penalties with robots than they had before uh, purchasing the robot, and it has an impact on the uh, milk price and on the economic efficiency uh, of, of the farm. Uh, so now, if we look at the whole system, uh, comparing farms in the same region with the same production system and the same herd size, 
uh, we can see that uh, farms which have purchased a robot are producing more milk per working unit, almost 100,000 liters extra compared with a farm with no robots. But each liter of milk has a lower profit. It's only 48 euros per thousand liter compared to 70 for the farms with no robots. So when we multiply the amount of milk by the profit per liter, we, we, uh, we, we will have the same total profit per farm. But if you have purchased a robot, it's uh, like uh, compulsory to produce more milk um, to cover the cost, the extra cost related to the uh, robots. Because each liter of milk has a lower profitability when you have a robot in your system. Um, so the robot is, is a risk in terms of economic efficiency, but one way to monitor this risk is to keep grazing. Um, we have compared uh, eight different regional databases to compare farms with AMS that have kept grazing with farms with AMS that have stopped grazing. And the farms are in the same background. So we can see that the farms that have kept grazing in the system after buying an AMS are producing less milk per working unit between 10,000 and 113,000 liters. But each liter of milk produced has a greater profitability between 19 and 44 euros per thousand liter. So when we multiply, uh, we land to a higher profit per working unit if you keep grazing. So there is a possibility to keep economic efficiency if you keep grazing after buying uh, the AMS, and it can be between 6,000 and 13,000 euro per working unit. So the, the second uh, challenge will be to keep grazing. So how can you integrate an AMS in the different production systems we have, in particular if you want to keep grazing, and in particular in the mountain areas? Um, so, um, different speakers have already been talking about the autograss milk projects when we've been working on maximizing grazing with a, with a milking robot. And just like Francoise in Belgium, we have the problem, uh, in particular in Western France, of uh, grazing uh, with a fragmented land. So, uh, the, the experiment we have in the experimental farm where I'm working in Trevares in Brittany, it's, uh, you will see there's some parallels with what uh, Francoise explained. Um, we have a fragmented uh, land uh, design. Um, we have an organic uh, farm uh, with two different or three different sites uh, that appear in, in green on the map. You have the winter site here with only 15, uh, 0.15 hectares per, per cow on the milking platform where the shed, the winter shed is located. And 4.5 kilometers away, we have a summer site uh, with almost 30, 35 hectares, which is only suitable for grass. It's too cold for mice. It's um, too, the, 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 the ground is not good for, for cereals. So it's good for, uh, for grazing, but it's very far from the shed. So uh, we had only one possibility uh, if we wanted to milk with a robot and keep grazing, it was to design a mobile uh, milking robot. You have a picture here, so you can see that compared to Belgium, we have a blue one and not a red one. Um, on a summer location, we remain during uh, six months from April uh, to October on the same place. We have built a stabilized platform to welcome the robot. So the robot is here in one trailer. You have the milk tank in another trailer. Here we have a waiting area uh, with slatted floor and a slurry pit. Um, we also move the three directions drafting gate because uh, we want to graze ABC, like uh, Bernadette explained in, in Moor Park. So we need a free gate, uh, uh, we need a free directions gate, a drafting gate to access to three different areas for grazing. We have stabilized uh, the tracks. We have a camera and we have a fixed concentrate silo, a second one and one. We have a satellite connection because we can't have any internet uh, on this place. We have power supply, water, and a small technical room on the other side of the, uh, of the tank trailer. So this is a summer location. It's located here near the road for the milk lorry. And you can see uh, the way we graze. We've been uh, comparing different types of grass management uh, with the uh, ABC system, for instance, on this map. Uh, so we try to combine uh, robotic uh, gr milking and grazing to maximize the use of grazed grass and the milk produced. 
So you have the morning uh, paddocks area uh, in yellow, the afternoon paddocks in orange, and the night paddocks in blue. The maximum distance is 800 meters on both directions. We have the three uh, stabilized main tracks. The drafting gate is located here, and uh, the cows can move freely from the paddocks to the robots, and the, the drafting gate is automatically changing the directions according to the time of the day, just like Bernadette explained in, in Mopark. Um, so a few figures about this experiment. We purchased the uh, robot in 2012. Uh, as I said, it's a blue robot. Uh, we started grazing in the year after, and the first transfer was performed in 2014. We have now performed six transfers because in one in 2015 we had to move twice because of the droughts. Uh, we have 30, 52 Holstein cows during a, a grazing period. Um, when we started, they were all Holstein. We converted to organic in 2015, and then we started uh, crossbreeding with uh, Jersey and Normand cows. So now we have crossbreeds as well. Uh, the grasslands are a base of uh, ryegrass and white clover. We are uh, grazing in rotational uh, grazing system with strip grazing with a front fence. Uh, we've been comparing different types of paddocks allocation, uh, A, AB, and ABC. Um, so you have some uh, performances on the right side. Uh, usually we remain there between five and six months, according to the, the grass growth. So we remain uh, on average 160 days with a 100% grass-based system. We cannot deliver any buffer feed. The cows are producing an average of 18 kilograms of milk per day with an average of 0.7 kilograms of concentrates per day. The average milking frequency is 1.6 milking per day. And uh, the box is producing, the AMS is uh, producing around uh, 900 liters of milk uh, per day. A um, few figures about uh, transfer. As Francois said, it's not really a problem now. We have 4.5 kilometers to cover. So we require three to four people during three to four hours. We are transferring the cows uh, in trailers, the tank, the robots, and the drafting gate uh, within three to four hours. Um, this way, we manage to graze 2.5 tons of dry matter per, per cow during these uh, six months, five to six months. So it's uh, four times more than what the farmers are doing in France with a, with a robot. We also record working time uh, during the winter when the cows are in the barn with the robot uh, inside the barn. The working time uh, around the dairy herd is below four hours per day. But when we turn to the, the, gra the, the grazing period uh, with a 100% uh, grazing system, uh, the working time per day is only two hours. So, 100% uh, uh, grazing system with this AMS, uh, it's time saving and it's a very low working time altogether. All you have to do is to uh, work around the robots uh, and uh, you have to uh, manage, uh, monitor the, the grass and move the three fences, two or three fences. We also, uh, of course, estimate the feeding uh, costs. So the winter, winter feeding cost is around uh, 90 euros per thousand liters. Uh, it's quite expensive because it's organic food. And uh, when we are uh, located on a summer location with only grass and 0.7 kilograms of, uh, of cereals, the feeding cost is decreased by 75% down to 22 euros. So it makes a, a very good uh, margin over feeding costs for, for, for the farm. So the 100% grazing period is an important, uh, leads to an important decrease, both in uh, working time and in feeding cost for the herd. So we are very happy with the system, but we still can improve things. And uh, over the last uh, two or three years, we've been working a lot on the cow traffic because we want to limit the human interventions. Um, and we want to reduce the, the waiting time of the cows. Uh, we have irregular milking intervals. Even if the cows can move freely, usually they come by groups to the milking and they have to wait. 
so we are working on different concentrate levels, the way we allocate the paddocks, two or three paddocks per 24 hours, the number of fetchings, the water supply, to see the impacts on milk quality and animal welfare. Animal welfare is an important issue because some cows are remaining a long time in a waiting area, so we are really working on the individual behavior of the cows, in particular the first lactations, and in particular now that we have three different types of, uh, of cows in the herd. The overall cost of the mobility uh, remains high because we had to buy the trailers and we had to service to make the servicing of uh, the summer sites. So uh, we will have to see if uh, within the 10 to 12 years of depreciation, we can cover the cost of the second uh, area with a decreased feeding cost. So I will uh, like to end my presentation with people because um, farmers are buying uh, robots to decrease labor and penibility. So what the farmers say uh, in the inquiries is that uh, the robots uh, really reach the target in, in terms of limiting the physical penibility. Uh, for time saving, well, as long as you remain with 50 cows, you are time saving with a robot. But most of the farms are increasing the cow numbers to the maximum because they think they can pay back the debts quicker. But in fact, if you have 70 cows on one box, you are not time saving at all. And uh, it's a lot of problems in terms of cow traffic and more work. The farmers say they have more time flexibility to organize themselves during the day. Uh, and the gains uh, compared to the previous uh, milking equipment, well, it depends uh, what type of equipment they had before. If they had a very old milking parlor, of course, they will say that uh, they had huge gains. But if they already had uh, milking parlors with uh, high specifications, they won't see so much difference. Sorry. Uh, but what farmers also say, uh, it is uh, about some residual constraints with AMS. Some cows fail to be milked properly. Uh, it's difficult to find replacement staff in some areas. So replacement staff, they can uh, milk in milking parlors, but they don't know how to uh, manage uh, a robot. So it's, it's particularly the problem for one person farms. Then you have the psychological load for some farmers. Uh, some farmers uh, do not manage to switch off the phone and they have alarms 24 hours uh, per 24 hours and uh, they don't sleep very well because they don't they, they did not manage to, to stop the, 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 the alarms or stop the phone. Uh, then the psychological load is also related to the high investment they made and they, they want a, a quick return on investment and sometimes they make mistakes like having too many cows on the box. Uh, becoming a 2.0 breeder is not possible for all the farmers. Uh, some farmers don't like the screens, they don't like the computers, they don't like technology, so they have problems with, uh, with robots. Not with the robot itself, but uh, with the computer. And for, with all the data the computer is producing. Farmers say they, that robots might save some time, but you never know how much time uh, you will, uh, you will uh, gain uh, every day. It's not the same every day. You never know when it will fail. So you, you can't be sure that you will save time and you can be sure at what time of the day you will have time saved. And of course, because most of the farms have saturated the box with the maximum cow numbers, uh, they don't have so much flexibility, in fact. Another problem is to give the right, uh, the right indicators for the farmers that have bought a, a robot. Uh, as Bernadette said, milking frequency might not be the right indicator. The right indicator for the farmers should be the profits. Um, milking frequency might be a good indicator in an indoor system uh, on the right uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But uh, mil milking frequency has, is not necessarily related to the profit. So there are some steering indicators uh, that can help on a day-to-day -day basis for technical monitoring. Uh, but milking frequency uh, should not reach the same level when the cows are grazing or when they are kept indoors and people should not uh, confuse uh, indicators. Um, the right indicator uh, should be related to profit, profit per working unit or over limiting factor. And that's why we are talking about the milk which is sold per box and not the milk per cow or the milking frequency per cow because this is not uh, related to profit. 
So we still have to work on the right indicator for the farmers and uh, make sure that the farmers are using the right indicators on their dashboards. So finally, um, our vision for AMS in France. Uh, well, the problem for us is uh, to keep the consistency of the whole production system and in particular uh, to keep cows grazing. As I said, part of the Dairy France uh, is producing PDO cheese and uh, it's, it's, they are banning AMS. Uh, most of the time, the cheese processes uh, meet technology problems with, robot, uh, with milk produced with robots because of uh, the change in the quality parameters. Uh, they are using sensitive milks to produce these specific types of cheese. Most of these cheese are made with raw milks and uh, there might be technology problems related to uh, uh, AMS milking. But it's not always the, the right explanation. Sometimes they are just excluding the AMS from the specifications because they, they want to avoid a uh, technology image that is considered as too much too negative. They want to keep a traditional image of the cheese processing and they think it cannot fit with AMS milking. Most of the time the farmers must uh, or the milk must be processed right after milking. So it's not possible if you have milkings all day long. It, it, it must be uh, regular times in the morning and the evening where the milk is collected and processed immediately after milking. So it cannot fit uh, with AMS uh, milking, but it's, it's mainly a problem of image. Um, then we have the problems in some regions of low density, uh, low dairy density areas. Um, they, they are expanding. Uh, these are the blue uh, areas on my map and also the white ones. I didn't comment on the white ones. Uh, it's the areas with a low density of milk per uh, square kilometer. In these areas, the retailers uh, are stopping by uh, uh, selling uh, AMS because uh, the farms uh, with AMS uh, are, are too far one from the other. Uh, it, uh, they have problems uh, for the access to AMS dealership for the farmers and in particular with uh, after sales service, it's too long. So the retailers themselves uh, adopt of their capacity to, uh, to come quickly to the farms and the farmers they also adopt of the capacity of the retailers to, to bring after sales service, after sales services. So in these areas, which are expanding at the moment with the farm uh, decrease, um, probably the AMS uh, will not expand more because there's too much distance between the farms. So it will limit the geographical expansion. So that's why we guess that uh, we might reach 15% of the French farms equipped altogether, but maybe not more. And uh, the regions uh, that are keeping all their farmers are the regions with PDO cheese. So in these ones, uh, there won't be any AMS. So that's why the expansion will be limited. Uh, so what we are doing in my institute is try to find the right advice to farmers and advisors uh, and this is a summary. Uh, the farmers must think all inclusive when they invest, not only the investment but also the operating cost and the impacts on the system when they purchase a robot. It must remain the farmer's decision and not the retailer's decision. Um, you should think of uh, purchasing a robot on a whole career plan. So maybe it's not a good idea to start your career as a young farmer purchasing a robot because you have a lot of depths and you are still fit so you can milk. But when you are reaching the second part of your career, maybe it's the right moment uh, to limit the penibility and you have reimbursed all your debts and maybe it's the right moment to purchase the, the robot for the end of your career. Um, and finally, uh, in terms of uh, milk quality, if the situation was bad before purchasing robots, it will probably be worse. But if, if it was good before, uh, you may be able to keep a good milk quality, uh, but you won't see any miracle arriving. So this is, these are all the important points for the farmer. Uh, he must pre-plan his project, assume his project, and in this case, it will be successful and AMS will be properly integrated in his production system and in his project. Thanks for your attention and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Valerie, for your, your time and, and sharing the, the amazing information you are sharing. So there's been a couple of questions come through. Because of time, we'll keep it to two questions. The first one is, um, 
what is the public perception regarding AMS? Why is that perception negative? Uh, so I think many mainly citizens uh, still consider farming and dairy farming as a kind of traditional activity uh, and everything should be as natural as possible. So they still think that all the cows are grazing, the cows are eating grass, they are eating homegrown home, home cereals. So there is a very bad uh, uh, knowledge of how milk is produced uh, the citizens and in particular in the big cities and I think it's the same in many countries uh, so if you show them that uh, the cows are milked in a robot uh, they probably will they have a, a negative image because I, they think it's too far from tradition and they would like farms to remain in tradition but they have no idea of uh, the problems of labor, staff availability, penibility of the work for the farmers uh, because they, they don't know about the way the milk is produced in fact. So this is a problem. Yeah, that, that's really interesting and, I, and we put out in one of our latest newsletters, I think it's two editions behind or um, some farmers using robotic milking to en engage consumers. So yeah. either stories online or opening the farm or visits or whatever, because they feel it's attracting people to the industry and bringing, kind of bridging that gap closer. So it's interesting to see kind of both ends of the story. Mm -hmm. The other question, Valerie, was around milk quality. Is that an issue only at the beginning, soon after commissioning the robots, or does it continue kind of years after moving into robotic milking? Usually the six first months are a problem and in most of the cases, um, most of the problems are solved after the first year, I would say. Uh, but some problems can't be solved, like uh, lipolysis, which is really related to uh, the, the distance between the, the milk tank and the robots and the way the, the, the milk is arriving in a tank, cow after cow. Uh, so this is an issue for Western France because we are producing butter and we have a criterion uh, for the milk payment. It's not the case in the other regions that are not producing butter. This is uh, the issue that can uh, hardly be solved. But for all the other issues, there are solutions. Uh, and usually when the farmers get some uh, advice from the dairy companies and from the extension services, they can solve the other problems. But of course, if you, if you put 70 or 72 cows on a robot, on one box, you have quality products, uh, quality problems as well. So it's also related to the, the level of saturation of the, of the boxes. Perfect. And the last question is, Francois and yourself both presented about a mobile robot. Are there commercial farmers doing that of moving the robot from one farm to the other? So uh, I, I put a picture on my presentation. We have uh, one farm in central France uh, that has a built uh, a double um, by robots with two boxes in one trailer. Uh, they have uh, 100 cows, 110 cows. Uh, they are usually, usually using the traditional system uh, that we have in the mountains, which is called transhumance, where you have your cows in a shed during six months near your farm, and then you go up in the mountains for six months. And they used to have two milking parlors, or they, are, they used to be, well, they used to have two sheds and moving the milking machine twice per year, and they have replaced the system. Uh, with a double mobile robot. Uh, they've been to Trevarez and they have copied the system, but it's double. And I think this is the only case I know in France. No, it's not very common. Excellent. Valérie, once again, thank you very much for your time. And, and Thanks a lot, Nicolas, for organizing this. No, no worries. It's been a, like it would be impossible without all of you. So thank you very much. Your insights have been amazing. And who knows, we might bring you all back for another presentation. Yes. We'd be happy thank to you, come to, to Australia next time. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> thank you, Valerie.